Kannan Gopalakrishnan. He was working as a senior architect at Engineering Design Research Center L&T Construction, India's largest construction company. He's also worked on projects ranging from institutional buildings to international airports, apartment complexes to aircraft hangars. He's also attended three international conferences and two national conferences and has also presented technical papers at the Jawaharlal Nehru University, Delhi and the MSRIT, Bangalore. He's also won the national championship at Archimen at the India's largest architecture quiz. Sir Kannan Gopalakrishnan currently runs a design firm, Habitat Design Studio and he is also a visiting faculty at the renowned architecture schools in Tamil Nadu. Welcome back to UGC lecture series. This is AR6006, Structure and Architecture. We are looking at units 3 and 4, Contemporary Structural Expression through Case Studies. We are at lecture 12 and we are looking at case studies now. Previously, if you remember, we were looking at case studies of a Renault distribution center in Swindon, UK and the Stansted Airport Terminal UK, both designed by Sir Norman Foster. Now in this episode, we will be looking at two very interesting buildings. One is in Spain and another building is in UK. The first building is the British Pavilion Expo 1992 in Sevilla, Spain. The second one is the Waterloo International Train Terminal, UK. Both these buildings are designed by Sir Nicholas Grimshaw. Now let us straight away proceed on to the first case study. British Pavilion Expo, Sevilla, Spain. The British Pavilion was a temporary construction standing from April to October of 1992. It was created for the Expo 92 in Sevilla, Spain. Grimshaw and Associates were asked to design the pavilion by the Department of Trade Industry who asked for maximum open floor space and a shaded outdoor area for people waiting to enter and a strong United Kingdom identification on the exterior. With this as the brief, Grimshaw went on to design the building and this is how the building looks from the outside. Formidable building with beautiful structural expression with clever use of materials and a lot of light again with a grand feature wall on one side which uses water as the main element as it tries to cool the lobby. These client requests influenced the design decisions but Grimshaw chose to use the pavilion to make a statement about energy flows and to consciously make very specific design choices that resulted in a structure highly attuned both to climate and to the needs of an exhibition space. Each phase of the pavilion is reflective of a set of design choices that create a shaded cool space in the midst of a sunny hot city that has daily temperature variations of up to 20 degree Fahrenheit. So the building went on to become a structure that was made of steel and canvas. So here you see another picture of the structural systems on the right hand side of the picture and of people waiting to enter the building standing in queues on the left hand side. Look at the way the architect has introduced light inside the building. Accounting for this dynamic climate of Sevilla, we just saw that the temperature difference is going to be 20 degrees Fahrenheit during the day. The building envelope changes on each wall. As the Grimshaw Architect website states, the design is characterized by structural clarity. The external skin of the structure varies to respond to climatic conditions. The pavilion creates a conditioned, comfortable interior that chooses to shy away from the abundant energy sources available in a large city like Sevilla. Here in this building, you can see the different walls of the building where there is a clear difference in the different walls. In one wall, you see a water feature and in the other walls, you see a lot of shading devices which acts as a temperature barrier 
and each wall is articulated in a different way in such a way that it works for the climate. Instead of building with the assumption that those systems will support whatever design is created, Grimshaw and Associates created a structure that was attuned to the specific climate of Sevilla and responded to it in a unique and beautiful way. Both the north and south walls are created using yarch technology. Fabric is stretched between the masts. Here you can see the masts of this building and between which the fabric is stretched and to form an arch like structure which creates the temperature barrier that was required. We also can take a look at the famous water wall which we described a certain while ago on this picture. The stretched fabric is shaded by a layer of additional fabric that keeps the hot southern sun from entering in directly, especially on the lower levels. This layer allows for more shading as well as heating buffer. Keeping heat from entering the pavilion is one of the main reasons why these shading devices were used. This double layer also serves as a VIP entrance. The PVC coated fabric makes up for the south and north walls as well as steel mass rigging technology which is used on the walls. The same technique used on the south side is also used here. However, the double layer technique is not used so the more indirect northern light cannot enter. This fabric creates a similar effect to a sheer curtain and successfully creates a gradual transition between indoor and outdoor variations in brightness. Outside of the north wall is a courtyard which is shaded by roof panels. Here you can see the building and on the outside of the building you can see how the panels are arranged and this is the facade where you can see the water feature wall and on top of it are the masts which they had described earlier which through which the canvas is stretched to make it look like a yacht like structure. And on the other side you see a big British flag which will be characteristic of the building to give it a strong UK character which the client wanted. The east side of the building is referred to as the water wall. It features the UK flag which is behind the layer of falling water that covers the wall. This water wall cools the eastern side of the building and it is not heated by the sun for most of the time. Uh, the people are going to use the pavilion from morning 9 to 6 so in that time period the water cools the entire portion of that particular wall in which the sun, direct sun does not enter during the portions of the day. This means that the water stays cool and the continual cycle of water cools the pavilion to approximately 82 degrees Fahrenheit when the outside temperature was 102 degrees Fahrenheit. The genius of this idea is to keep a water wall and to make the water itself cool the interior of the building. But the problem with the water wall is that when the water gets heated up by the atmospheric heat or by direct sun, if the water gets heated up, water cannot cool the interiors. So it's impossible for a hot water curtain to cool the interiors. So what Grimshaw did was he designed the eastern side of the building in such a way that it does not get heated while the people were occupying the building. So it, it cools the building by 20 degrees when the outside temperature is about 102 degrees. The inside temperature will be close to 82 degrees Fahrenheit of course. Here we see the sketches of the water wall uh, by Grimshaw. Here is what there is a outside temperature of about 102 degrees Fahrenheit and this is the water feature and on the inside of the water feature when it goes inside it becomes 82 degrees Fahrenheit and when there is AC and other things operating heat exchange it comes to a, an average temperature. This design choice creates a more passive cooling system which also uses a small amount of electricity for the water pumps that cycle the water. This electricity is powered by photovoltaics on the roof. The cooling effects of the water wall also mean that the air condition system utilized in some places in the pavilion only has to cool the air another 10 degrees as the air condition space was kept at 72 degrees Fahrenheit. That is what we saw in the earlier picture here. The air conditioned space was kept at 72 degrees Fahrenheit. 
the water wall could achieve only 82 degrees. So, the remaining 10 degrees needs to be cooled by the AC system. The, this is the other side of the building where it is completely shaded to keep the sun away from the inside of the building to prevent the building from getting heated up. The fabric reflects most of visible light and only very small amount of heat and light gets transferred between the fabric layer and the wall layer. So, even though there is filtered light which is getting passed through the building, the heat is definitely reduced. This is another view at the water feature in the front of the building. As the west wall gets the afternoon sun, Grimshaw chose to make it a barrier condition, lining it with heavy water tanks filled with sand. This design choice keeps the western afternoon sun from heating the interior of the pavilion. The roof has a set of solar panels that are suspended above the roof plane which provide shading from direct sunlight as well as power from photovoltaic cells. The power from these cells fuel the minimum amount of air conditioning needed as well as the water pump that draws the water back up to the top of the east wall. The solar cells face south to catch maximum sunlight. This is uh, one of the famous buildings that was uh, designed by Grimshaw. The brief only stated that the building needs to have a very strong UK character and the brief gave him only very minimal directions uh, such a way that the space needs to be maximum and there needs to be external transition space and a very minimal requirement of sorts. But what Nicholas Grimshaw decided to do was he wanted to include the parameter called environment inside his building and the introduction of the parameter of environment inside the building created such a strong character for the building itself so that use of uh, steel masts and yards like fabric materials on the walls, facades and use of water walls, use of sand filled water tanks on one side and uh, using evaporative cooling as one of the primary methods to reduce the interior temperature from 102 degrees otherwise on the outside to about 82 degrees uh, on the inside whereas a comfortable room temperature is only about 72 degrees and the load on the air conditioning is very very less. So imagine a building that can give you very many solutions, solution to very many problems instead of just the main problem which was stated by the clients themselves. The main problem was to create an image of UK in the exhibition 92 in Sevilla, but Grimshaw did that and in addition to that he also challenged the whole system of designing pavilions and he also made it made sure that environment is not something that is to be taken lightly. This is ladies and gentlemen British Pavilion Explo Sevilla Spain. With a quick look at this building shot we will move on to the next building that we are going to see in the section and this is a very very interesting building designed by Sir Nicholas Grimshaw again and this building is called the International Terminal Waterloo. The International Terminal of Waterloo is a multifaceted transport interchange that was designed to facilitate the journeys of 15 million international rail passengers per year. Grimshaw's brief for the project was to build a streamlined terminal and because of the international service, it had all the requirements of an airport including full security screening, immigration and customs border control. The International Terminal is not an airport building as against what we saw in the previous episode. We saw Stansted Airport Terminal by Sir Norman Foster and today we are going to look at a railway station, a railway terminal. But this railway terminal has one very very important feature which is strikingly similar to an airport because this terminal is international terminal which means there are trains that uh, take off from this place to France to uh, Netherlands and to Belgium to other countries which means the terminal has all sorts of things like the airport does just like the immigration, the security control, the border control, uh, the passport checks, visa checks and every single thing which an airport does. So let's see how Nicholas Grimshaw tackles this kind of a complex system in a traditional setting like Waterloo. So when the brief was given to him Grimshaw produced this building. Look at the massive steel columns which he has used and to create a very very large massive open space on the inside which is very beneficial for the people to transfer from one place to another because 
airport in itself is a shed which, which can be compared to a large shed and international terminal railways is very similar in that parameter can be compared to a large shed. This is another view of the platforms. Look at the clean curves which Grimshaw is trying to make here. The contrast between the opaque panels on the side and the transparent panels on one side. He clearly marks the difference at the center of the building and then he clearly states that on one side I need light to come inside the terminals, on one side I need only diffused light to enter the terminals. A clear clever premeditated choice of how much light you want to let inside your buildings. All these facilities within a constrained central London site through which passengers could pass quickly and efficiently. It was a big challenge because Waterloo is one of the primary, one of the very very important portions of London and it has a very historic background also. And to provide a building in such a congested way, to provide a vast expanse of space that has a terminal feeling in the constant space of Waterloo was very, very difficult. The resulting landmark design is a monument to the new railway age heralded by the advent of cross-channel rail travel in Britain. The roof responds to the dictates of the site, specifically to the west where it must rise more steeply in order to accommodate the height of the trains. Here the steep of the thing is shallow whereas here it is pretty steep, the slope of the roof. Here it is shallow and here it is pretty steep because they need to accommodate the height of the trains here. So the rise of this side of the portion is steeper than this side, this side it is shallower. Again look at the massive steel columns cladded. Look at the way the panels have been created, turned and to create passage for the light and the same thing is happening here. Look at the way panels is smoothly transitioned from one place to another. Same way that is happening over here. And these are the complex structural connections that was needed to keep the structure stable. So the building design of the western side is clad in glass providing arriving passengers with views of Westminster. There is another reason why Grimshaw chose to leave the western wall open, not just to get the light inside. Also he wanted the passengers to take a look at the Westminster which was visible on one side. Because often in architecture what you have to do is, when you have an interesting site and we have a very good view of something from the site, we often what we do is, we don't neglect that view, we try to include that view inside our buildings in such a way that the buildings itself would create like a passageway. Here the terminal is a passageway, it's just a building that one has to enter when they are transferring from one country to another country. So the moment they come and step inside London, the only thing which they will see is see through these glass walls here is the Westminster building which is the most famous landmark in the UK. So imagine you are in the railway station and there is one side full of open glass and then through which you get enormous amount of sunlight at the same time you get this beautiful view of Westminster on that side. So that is the idea behind using opaque panels on one side and transparent panels on the other side. Such is the genius of architecture. Underground, a two-story viaduct supports the platforms and incorporates two floors of passenger facilities. Departure and arrivals, a basement car park and the brick walls underneath the main line station. Departures and arrivals are assigned a level each to encourage single direction of passenger movement on each floor. In any kind of any terminal building, the first and the foremost thing that we should consider is circulation, the movement of the people. We cannot have contradicting movements of people, people moving here and there, people moving from one end to another and there are another bunch of people moving from this end to the other and they keep bumping into each other. People 
uh, they they wouldn't know which way to go some people will walk on the left side of the pavement some people will walk on the, walk on the right side of the pavement so there is no clear m m demarcation uh, when there is traffic when the traffic is two f two way so what grimshaw has done is all the arrivals at one level all the departures at another level which means that uh, the traffic flow of the passengers is only unidirectional so the arrival passengers they come they step out to the railway station then they walk out to the city and the departure passengers they come out into the city and then they directly go towards the trains which means there is only unidirectional pedestrian flow of traffic so you have, what you're seeing here is uh, a waiting lounge in the railway station look at the same use of light and ac uh, uh, panels which he has designed the, the same panels which is repeating best known for its 400 meter long curved glass roof grimshaw's international terminal at waterloo station provides airport quality accommodation for the london end of the eurostar train services through the channel tunnel to paris and brussels the length of the trains in the curve of the five new tracks dedicated to the eurostar service at the side of the existing station determines the geometry of the new building including the distinctive roof itself the distinctive roof is the main feature here because the uh, nowhere in any of the previous train terminals had this kind of a distinctive roof been administered because uh, because of the curvature itself the amount of glass and the amount of material which would be required to build this kind of a roof is enormous so that is probably why this kind of a roof system is abandoned uh, not used in this kind of uh, buildings and uh, they keep saying eurostar but eurostar stopped its services at waterloo and they have commenced it commenced the trains at st pancras railway station a few years ago this is another look at the same thing the showing the distinctive roof here which opens up steeply on this side and it is shallow on the other side other elements of the building include a reinforced concrete box to accommodate an underground car park provide a foundation to the underground train lines and a two story viaduct supporting the eurostar platforms which are reached by escalator from a subterranean departure lounge the roof accounted for 10% of the overall budget itself it is the same picture of the same terminal but from the other end in contrast to more recent complex curved glass roofs such as grimshaw zone eden project or uh, norman foster's british museum courtyard the waterloo roof was designed to use standard sized glass sheets which overlap and use a concertina joint to accommodate the dual curve of the roof arch in the track the international terminal is at the west end of the station concourse at the waterloo station most of the interior and platforms can be seen only with a ticket for travel it you directly cannot go into the platforms and take a look at the building you need a ticket to and this is how the terminal looks overall terminal the way the building curves on this side at the same time the way the building has curve in plan on here the 20th century society has applied for the urgent spot listing of the terminal which is under imminent threat from a 400 pound million redevelopment there is a redevelopment going on and uh, the 20th century society is uh, calling for a uh, spot listing of the building at grade 2 they wanted this they want this building to be listed as grade 2 buildings so that it can be uh, protected from massive redevelopment which is happening it was one of the highest profile buildings in the world at the time of its completion in 1993 winning a number of prestigious award including the reba president's building of the year award look at the standard sheet glass patterns which creates the different uh, creating different views less visible to the passers by but just as impressive as the vast concrete substructure underneath which contains a dedicated level of arrival and departure and a car park waterloo is a definitive work in the oeuvre of sir nicholas grimshaw and a key example of british high tech design this is how the building looks from the top you can actually see the curvature of the building here and the, when the building is a little more transparent on this side and a little more opaque on this side we can clearly see all those things in the plan itself some of the sketches which nicholas grimshaw drew for this building these are sections of the building which were created another section in which we can clearly see the five tracks and the fly five platforms and also we can see the difference in the roof here we can see the shallow roof and here we see the steep roof and this is the completely open 
and the glazed part and this is the partly open partly opaque part we've come almost to an end of this lecture in this lecture we understood the contemporary structural expressions in an expo kind of a building and a terminal kind of a building we also understood the design philosophies and concepts of a famous architect sir nicholas grimshaw with the knowledge that we have had so far from this episode we should be able to answer these questions which are going to appear on your screen explain the waterloo train terminal uk with sketches and details explaining how the transition in the terminal is so smooth like unprecedented earlier explain the british pavilion expo sevilla spain with sketches and details tracing how an architect can give more to the building than the brief demanded how does sir nicholas grimshaw view a project explain biomimicry with his projects and examples we have reached the end of this episode and i look forward to meeting you again with more case studies on the other side of this episode so thank you